Welcome to the Sacred Ancestry Podcast, a show about discovering the true human potential. Let's dive deep into physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. I'm your host, Thomas Worm. Who are you not being, and what are you not doing in life? Discover the person you know you could be at mountainmindtricks.com. What if you become the person you know you could be? What would happen if you only had positive thoughts and feelings about your future? What would happen if you didn't have negative emotions or limiting beliefs? Mountain Mind Tricks is specialized in 8-hour sessions that release anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, and anxiety forever. Get 30 years of therapy in 8 hours. All you have to do is go to mountainmindtricks.com, click the discovery session button, schedule a time, and fill out the form. Go to mountainmindtricks.com. I discovered this new technology recently. Check out mountainmindtricks.com slash EMF protection. Essential Vibes has this resonant frequency wristband, which stops EMFs from stressing your body. Because that stress is removed, people are seeing dramatic improvements in pain management, strength, mental clarity, memory, sleep, and a bunch of other things. Go to mountainmindtricks.com slash EMF protection and check it out. You know, the first time I saw this, I totally thought it was a scam. You know, but then I put it on, I was able to test my strength and balance and see that it improved significantly. Even my sleep has changed. I was so impressed with this, I had to add this to my business. So go to mountainmindtricks.com slash EMF protection. I'm so excited today to have my guest, Daniel Eide. He's a fellow master practitioner. We went to class together this summer, and he's working on this amazing book, Wild Woman's Journey and Mystical Journeys in Quantum Recovery. And, and uh, it's such a beautiful title, such a beautiful book. I know you've been working so hard, uh, Daniel. Um, can you introduce yourself and let people know kind of how you got here and, and what you're working on exactly and kind of what you see for yourself? Okay. Hello, I'm Daniel Ide, and my uh, my own particular journey has brought me through years of you know personal growth and development, and my own self discovery process helped me to come to a really dramatic but yet subtle conclusion that um, we're living in a mythology. We're living in a in a dreamscape, something that our ancient ancestors possibly dreamed up. And somehow we're fulfilling that. And, uh, and I love this long cycle notion of our reality that we're participating in some kind of cosmic uh, cycle. Uh, things coming around in 100 year cycles and 250,000 year cycles and even more. Um, and uh, the idea is, is that our troubles are not so personal, but they're actually cosmic. And even our joys are cosmic. And um, we're sharing in a breath we're sharing in a life and we're sharing in a perception that our ancestors be before us um, shared and our ancestors many thousands of years to come will similarly share. And, uh, oh, so beautiful, Daniel. I love it. And just yeah. that cosmic, cosmic idea of these cycles. It's, it's amazing. And, and tell us more about this book that you're working on. That's going to be coming soon. Well, it's, um, in my mind, it's a long time coming, but uh, recently having worked with you, Thomas, doing a breakthrough session, I, I, I recognized that I have all the tools and all the experience that I needed. And, uh, and so it became about, you know, making sense of my own personal journey. And I work with clients in mental health and substance abuse recovery. And, uh, and in my conversations with them, I saw this line of continuity and, uh, and it was about their own personal stories, which are wrapped up inside of that, that larger uh, cosmology. And, um, and so the book itself focuses on the, the human story and, uh, and then juxtaposes it to the individual story. And the, most of us, we have our greatest growth spurts when we face and overcome great challenges or crises in our life. Um, Nobody shows up to a mental health program or a recovery program on a, on a winning streak, so to speak. And so they're in a rebirthing process. It's, it's an excellent time for a conversation about capturing uh, oneself in the moment and beginning to reinvent and rediscover, you know, who am I? Ask those grand questions. You know, well, you know, you know where did I come from? Uh, what am I doing here? 
and, uh, and where am I going next? And, uh, and begin to write a new story. And so the book that I'm working on is, is blending that cosmic story of the story of us, you know, human beings. We have this really long story about where we came from. You know, we've got the, the Lucy, um, you know, archaeological story, but we also have the, the Anunnaki story, uh, Anunnaki story of the Sumerian, um, you know, um, high, um, uh, writings, you know, as, as, um, as uh, you know, translated by um, Zachariah Sitchin. And bringing us to a, a deeper understanding that, you know, we're not really from where we think we're from. And uh, that story plays out in our relationship to our mother and our father. It plays out in our relationship to ourselves. So when we have these crises of identity or crisis of addiction, um, mental health issues can completely leave people feeling, you know, uh, disassociated and disconnected from themselves. And so while they're on that journey of reconnecting, um, I often say, go big, you know, or as they say in NLP, chunk up, you know, use, use the largest model possible to liberate you from any false limitation of smallness, uh, that I'm not good enough. And uh, it's amazing how just getting people to think in a cosmic way really expands their perception of self and self healing. Um, they get outside of their troubles and next thing you know, hey, it's not such a big deal anymore. And so, and I've been piecing together my own personal perceptions of, of, of how quantum mechanics has become the quantum physics that we understand today and how it's really building a bridge between our spiritual and scientific perceptions. And, uh, and the, the model in recovery is, the tw is basically the 12 step model, which um, you know, is, is chock full of spiritual references and yet this is a very physical, you know, addiction related recovery process. And yet the, the, the end goal, if you get to step 12, it, it assumes that you're having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And I thought, hey, you know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna finish that bridge between the worlds if you don't give people a language or a story that they can latch onto? Um, it's not enough just to say, oh yeah, I've discovered God um, you need to have a relationship. You need to have an understanding that catapults you beyond, you know, what is mental illness? What is addiction? And, um, you know, some of the greatest mystics of time, um, their, their spiritual enlightenment has been misinterpreted as, um, as psychosis. And so the whole idea of the wild woman warrior's way, you know, is that we're in a mystical journey and we're somehow breaking through to a higher level of perception of self individually and collectively as a species, actually as a planet, now that we sufficiently understand that we live on a conscious planet. That, that's a concept that most people don't even know how to embrace just yet. You know, that, that Mother Earth is alive. It is actually a living organism, just like the microbiomes in our gut. Absolutely. That's amazing, Daniel. And, and I love this idea of chunking up to the next perception. And I think that's, you know, the work that me and you both do with the breakthrough sessions, it's you're chunking up to that next version of yourself. Right. And, and, uh, and I'm curious on like, I, I've dealt with addictions. I've had serious addictions in my life. You know, um, I'll, I'll be blunt. And I was a drug addict as a teenager. Like I've gone through those stages and it took a spiritual awakening in a near death experience for me to overcome that. And so I'm so interested in this. Uh, I I've heard of the 12 steps program. I think a lot of people have, but what is the 12 steps and, and like how, after we go through the 12 steps, generally, I want to hear kind of your, your, um, your idea about them. Okay. I would love to, you know, um, I have to admit, um, I am not of the orthodoxy of AA and the 12 steps, but I am very fond of the model. And I can say with all honesty and with gratitude that 12 steps has played a major role in my own recovery and personal growth and development. Um, but I can also say that as an appreciator of history and man's evolutionary, you know, path, um, there are aspects of the 12-step recovery program that I believe um, uh, they're due for an upgrade. They're, they're, they're due for interpretations. Uh, I'm fond of saying that between every step of the 12 steps of AA, 
there is an infinite number of, of meta or medi steps in between. I talk about, you know, between step two and step three, there's 2.5, there's 2.7. And yeah. every individual is having a very personal experience. And I encourage them, use those 12 steps. Those are your guardrails. They're going to keep you on the path of recovery. But while you're on that journey, have a very personal and very, and very intimate experience of your recovery um, try not to do just what the other guy has done, but literally have your own authentic awakening process. And to the last step in the 12 step recovery uses the phrase, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And I'm pretty much wanting every individual to have a very personal path as they work their way towards that 12 step. You can assume the word enlightenment is wrapped around having had a spiritual awakening and um, that's the path of the bodhisattva uh, from the Buddhist teaching that having achieved enlightenment, uh, the, the, um, the experiencer has basically a choice uh, to move on to the next level of existence, which is beyond this body, this planet, or to stay here and to, you know, to be amongst the people and teach from your wisdom and to share of your experience and knowledge and wisdom. And, uh, and uh, that is actually what the 12 steps is preparing everybody for, you know, to go into your community and share from what you've experienced. And so um, without getting into every single step, which, you know, um, I have to admit, I am not a, uh, a quarter of the 12 steps. I just use it as a model, as a guide. And, um, and, I, and um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of doctrine there that's very personal to everybody who's been through any kind of Alcoholics Anonymous, Anonymous program or Narcotics Anonymous program. And I certainly wouldn't want to step on anybody's toes by invalidating. Really what I want to do is I want to expand. I would love to see the 12 steps of recovery um, brought to children's awareness prior to drug and alcohol education. Have, and if you were to read the 12 steps, you can see that it is a spiritual program, non-denominational, and, uh, and it speaks very highly to, you know, all of us having a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose, um, you know, beyond our economic and social and political and, and, um, and religious, you know, aspirations. You know, there's, there is a much higher purpose for all of us that we're participating in. If a child knew that before they got into drugs and alcohol, I think that they would have a healthier sense of self, or maybe they would never get into drugs and alcohol because they would already be achieving the fulfillment of what drugs and alcohol offer, which there is actually a certain degree of fulfillment in drugs and alcohol. I have to admit, for many years, I was having a damn good time, you know, you know prior, yeah. prior, prior to the end, you know. Right, right. It all, it all just, I, I would agree with that. You know, I think I had an amazing time in high school and those teenage years like that, but it really came to a head at some point of like, you got to take care of yourself and you got to yeah. really not distract from yourself. Cause I think that's when I, when I think about addiction, I think it's a distraction from something a lot, a lot deeper yeah. sometimes. And, and I'm not an expert in that by any means, but that's my personal experience is that, that distraction, that um, running away from, you know, and I think this 12 step program or this model that you have, it's really, it's learning how to run towards something or, yeah. I'm really curious on like this 12 step, like how do you think a breakthrough session fits into this model? Like where would that be? Would it be the beginning, the end, anywhere? It doesn't matter. No, it really doesn't matter. And because uh, every individual shows up exactly where they need to be in their process of self-discovery. And, uh, and that's one thing I love too about the way the 12 steps works. It, it literally takes you through a process of identifying with yourself on a, on a step-by-step -step basis. Um, I, I literally had uh, a hard time with the 12 steps because I was not a very linear thinker at the time. I was 38 years old. It was my first real endeavor into sobriety and taking instructions from others in sobriety. And, um, and uh, my personal breakthrough with the 12 steps is I literally took the piece of paper that had the 12 steps listed on it and I cut it into 12 separate strips of paper, each numbered and the, the instructions for each step. And I made a pile on the floor 
And at random, I pulled a strip of paper from the pile. And if it said step four, that is what I worked on. And I was, I was literally praying beforehand, you know, you know, to the spirit, to my angels, my guides, um, you know, guide me, show me what I need to work on. Because the linear, the linear progression was, um, was frustrating me. And I found myself going back to step one so many times. Uh, and in AA culture, that's raising your hand, saying that you have less than 24 hours of sobriety. And, uh, and that really works on your, on your self-worth. And it really works on your ability to think, oh, I can do this. Uh, so when I started mixing it up outside of my sponsor's direction, actually, many of the sponsors that I tried to work with were very, um, um, they were not, how would you say, supportive of my kind of oblique kind of um, approach to my own recovery. Uh, they thought that I should just follow instructions and do what I'm told. And I'm just like, well, you know, I, I kind of need to have a personal experience. So I was self-inventing. Uh, right in my beginning days. And so that process of randomizing the 12 steps really actually benefited me. Um, I don't know if it would work for anybody else. So I really had a very personal experience inside the recovery of the 12 steps that got me beyond that, that insidious cycle of 29 and a half days, you know, you know, never making it to 30 days. You know, I did that for a couple of years. It was, it was really hard on my on my, on my personal well-being, you know, physically I remain fit, but psychologically I, I felt very beaten down by my inability to get 30 days of sobriety for, for a couple of years. Wow. That's amazing. And, and, uh, the way you talked about randomizing your, your steps and doing it out of order and doing it like unorthodox, you know, I think that really leads into like the quantum recovery and how yeah. quantum mechanics works of like, you know, we can, if we can collapse a particle or a wave into a particle, just what else can we do with our mind, you know? And, yeah. and I'm yeah. curious on what, what the quantum recovery is that you're working on right now, like in your book and what is the quantum process of this, of this recovery that you're talking about? It's the both and aspect, which is part of what quantum mechanics is offering up. Um, and it's observer dependent, meaning you know, it's going to be what you put your, your, your attention on. And also it's, it's very dependent upon your intention. So, um, you know, you know, you're motivating the, the material world from, from, from your, from your viewpoint, you're, you're literally bringing into reality by, by the law of observer dependency. Um, so, so what I focused on was what it became. I focused on success in recovery. It actually did become that. I focused on failure in recovery. It became that. And so it was just a matter of more of me learning, you know, you know, and, and definitely there's a lot of esoteric teachings out of the Eastern tradition that basically says, you know, who, who is the I asking who am I? And, uh, and I started to apply that to, well, isn't that really what quantum physics is too? It's, uh, it's all what the observer is wanting to see and then declaring, oh, this is what I see. Um, even uh, Sorengar Kierkegaard, the existentialist, said from the 1800s, you know, once we name something, we negate it. We never see it again. We only see what we think it is. And so as we look more and more into what quantum physics is offering us as a way of looking at the world, we realize that our perception of self is who we are. And so once again, that, in, that perception is interpretation. And as so we start to go deeper down the rabbit hole and begin to grasp onto the idea that we are creating our reality and taking responsibility for it, there's an amazing kind of source of power that starts to rise up. And, uh, and yeah, we have to overcome a lot of, a lot of personal you know, perceptions that we've been very fond of. Actually, you know, we, we love our troubles just as much as we love our successes. It's a, it's a strange kind of thing to say, but, you know, we can be addicted to pain. And, and once we've taken away the drugs and taken away the alcohol, the story of no, I can't is strangely addictive. You know? Yeah, absolutely. That kind of secondary gain, like you're gaining something off of that doubt yeah. or the... Yeah 
the the pattern that just keeps going and going and yeah. and dragging you the spiral down is addictive i've been there i i know that it's yeah. it's a it's a hard place to be but there's possibility especially when we look at the quantum physics we look at the eastern traditions and yeah. and um you know i just finished writing something and publishing about the same thing of like the quantum mechanics and ancient traditions are seriously on the cusp of merging. It's so interesting where Eastern mythology, you know, Buddhism, Taoism, all of those Eastern religions or philosophies are, they're starting to just cross over like a Venn diagram of like, there's similarities now in science and spirituality. And especially with a lot of the new age, like Dr. Joe Spinza, the great Bradens, you know, the Bruce Liptons of the world, it's, all everything they're doing has quantum mechanics backing it up and it's just like wow this yeah. is real this is a real deal thing that we're talking about is is a quantum recovery a quantum healing a quantum anything that we want we can create it right and, and i loved the way you talked about getting back to taking responsibility i think there's so much power in that of just taking ownership of who we are as human beings and and uh you know, I'm curious on on how you're bringing in these Eastern mythologies and the cosmology. We talked about that briefly, but more specifically, like how is that coming into the book for you? Well, it's basically supporting the idea that um, uh, we are not so much discovering anything, but we're actually remembering. And, um, and our ancestors, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, whether they knew it or not, um, they chiseled into stone the teachings of their time, which now we are seeing it with fresh eyes. So it's, it's not as if Buddhism or, you know, hermetic teachings, uh, you know, Egyptology is, is showing us much about the interpretation of hieroglyphics. And, and now we have, you know, all of the reinterpretations of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi and, and, um, you know, our ancestors were privy to these understandings, and I believe to a certain degree, and there are others who speak of this much more uh, succinctly, but um, we, are, we have been traumatized somehow as a species, and within us, in our DNA, is a type of trauma that we are slowly overcoming. Um, you know, if you read the Bhagavad Gita or any of the uh, ancient um, uh, uh, you know, Sanskrit uh, writings, you can see that there's a perception there which is superior to our own. We're, we're actually struggling to understand that which our ancestors, five and 6,000, maybe even as many as 15 to 25,000 years ago, understood much better than us. And, uh, and that we're, we are through the pathway of Newtonian physics, uh, discovering quantum physics, and, and we're realizing that that we are not so much going somewhere new; we're returning to someplace old, ancient. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful, and uh, it brings me back to the idea of um, of I think a lot of all these traditions in the quantum mechanics it's, it's, it's lost traditions. I do believe that exactly what you're saying. And I think it brings up something that Graham Hancock has said a lot, if you're familiar with him, is mm -hmm. that we're a species with amnesia. And he, he speaks specifically about, you know, 13,000 years ago, 12,500 years ago, about this gigantic comic impact uh, and uh, tidal waves across North America from the ice sheets melting a meat, like instantly kinds of traumatic events and the way when he said that I thought well that makes so much sense that we have all this trauma and that we don't like we're just trying to kill the earth because it hurt us before that's like this weird traumatic thing that's going on I there's something in there right there's some sort of trauma I 100% agree that we're we're angry at the planet and I really hope that there is a way for us to remedy that for forgiveness or or heal that trauma to overcome that because I can tell you as a wildland firefighter and being out in the wilderness for weeks on end and being in fire landscapes, it's like the fire has consciousness, the trees have consciousness, and there's so much more consciousness and aliveness to this planet than, you know, 99% of people give it. And uh, 
it's so important that we tap into that consciousness, isn't it? Yeah. So, and we're and we're in that time of remembering. Um, I like to think of things as as eras or epochs or ages. And um, and if it took us thousands of years to be traumatized and forget, we got to go easy on ourselves and expect that we're remembering in a similar cycle of time. Um, if there's a quantum leap of perception, well, lucky us. Uh, chances are that's not going to happen. You know. Um, there definitely are stories of individuals experiencing spontaneous moments of samadhi, which is, you know, full on enlightenment, you know, awareness of, of self and other as one, which is absolutely gorgeous. So it doesn't belie any possibility that we as a species, you and I connected to each other through the ether could not have that spontaneous moment. But in the meanwhile, we got some work to do. We got some cleaning up to do, you know. And if, and I say the same thing in addiction for all of my clients, I say, hey, you know, how many years were you hitting it hard? You know, how, how long were you really at it? I, I get a lot of big numbers like, oh, 12, 13. Sometimes I get some 30 year guys and girls that come into my groups. And I'm like, so do you think 30 days is sufficient? That's one of the benchmarks in recovery is your first 30 days. And um, I said, do you think 30 days is sufficient to cover 30 years of drinking and smoking pot? And, and you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, it kind of seems ridiculous, doesn't it? I'm like, yeah, you know, give yourself more time. You're rewiring your brain. You're actually regrowing your body. You know, your body's going to replace all of its cells in the course of a seven year cycle. You know, give yourself some time, you know, be patient, you know, and, but, you know, of course, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, stop, stop eating junk food, you know, and stop having negative thoughts. Most of us don't even appreciate how, how poisonous our own thoughts are, you know, and, and that's where I'm really going with this Wild Woman's Warrior's Way book, is I would like to see people appreciate beyond alcohol and, 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 and controlled substances that, you know, once you take away the alcohol and the drugs, the addict is still there. And really, that's where the true growth starts to begin. Now you're taking away the, the big distractors, uh, gambling, food, sex, anything that's destroying your life, even though you enjoyed it in the beginning, that's actually the worst kind of addiction. We have addictions that are actually pleasant. If you look in the ancient um, uh, Oxford Dictionary, the definition, the root, the root derivation of it is adoration, you know, having a type of devotion to. And uh, which is kind of a nice thing when you think about it. You know, I like to think that I'm addicted to my, my girlfriend. She's a lovely woman. She's my favorite addiction, I say. And so I have a very healthy attachment. I have a very healthy exercise of my passion and my adoration. You know, when I was drinking heavily in the beginning, I kind of thought it was fun. You know, when I was doing all night excursions to go get drugs, you know, two cities away and I drove for four hours, there was something victorious about the achievement of that outcome. And I often tell guys and girls, hey, look how clever you were in your addictions. You know, throw out the drugs and the alcohol, but keep the ambition, keep that, keep that wild woman, keep that, keep that warrior aspect about you and now apply it towards your relationships in a good way for positive outcomes, apply it towards your business models, you know, apply it towards your favorite passions like playing guitar or fishing. You know, if you if you went fishing or if you did your job with the same kind of passion you put into achieving drunkenness or or heroin abuse or any of those things, you'd be amazed how successful you could be. You know, that's the upside of addiction. And I think in a way, if we can translate that that energy into a positive outcome, it's still good. It's very, very good. You know, no guilt, no shame. Yeah, absolutely not. And I'm curious on how the, the, the people you work with and addictions in general, how, you know, uh, for me, I felt like I just didn't fit in, like I was totally different, like I'm not, I'm not up to society's specs, like I'm, you know, in school, it was like, I was so bored because I already knew what the teacher was going to say, and I know that sounds crazy, but it was like, everything was just boring because I already, I already knew what you said, I already read the book because I already looked at it in my mind, like that was kind of where I was, and it was like, I didn't fit in society at all. You know, I didn't fit into groups. And I think maybe that's kind of the, is that a seed or is that part of this addiction that grows in the young people? I like to think that you were a mystic, that you were a shaman, that you were, you were, you were already seeing beyond the horizon. And what was holding you back 
was the horizon. And the horizon was being hardlined for you by, by, by social structure, by cultural expectations, even if they were just within your mind. Um, those, those limitations, that's what we're actually rebelling against. Um, and drugs and alcohol are vehicles for, for rebellion. You know, they, they do serve a certain function. Um, you know, some of my, my, my you know, greatest heroes, um, drugs and alcohol were part of their liberation expression. Um, some survived, some didn't. And, um, and, and so I, I consider drugs and alcohol to be a legitimate, you know, break from society. But unfortunately for some of us, the average is around somewhere between 10 and 25% of the users, um, there's addiction compulsion that um, becomes self-destructive. Um, not everybody who shoots heroin becomes a heroin addict. Not everybody who drinks alcohol becomes an alcoholic. Um, but there is something that, that I can say that is alcoholic behavior. And if it can be captured at a, at a young age and it can be you know, trained and honed that alcoholic behavior can be a quality. It can be, that can, actually can be an asset to that, that person. Same with uh, attention deficit disorder. Um, look how often we hear of some genius performing at, at high functioning levels. And it turns out that they have characteristics that are consistent with, um, with Asperger's syndrome or autism, you know? And, uh, and, and they end up taking uh, something that we, we socially consider to be a deficit and they turn it into um, an asset, a benefit. And I think with addiction, yourself included, there was a young man that if there was just a, a proper mentor or guide or someone who came along or a group or a collective and captured your attention at the right time, um, you could have been catapulted beyond addiction, you know, experience. But who's to say if you look at things in a much more cosmic sense, you had to go through the addiction cycle. It was a gift to you. So you could become who you are today. You know, does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I truly believe that, that I had to go through that process, that, that dark night of the soul, as some people call it, right? We, sometimes we have to go through the pain to really turn it into an opportunity. And it's, the work that you're doing is so amazing with this. The, the addictions are so real. I mean, yeah. it's a big problem in our society and especially with everything going on in the world, with the pandemic and everything else is just, uh, it's just amplified, you know? And, and in my world, the wildland fire community, like this year, 2020 was horrendous. The fallout alone, the mental health crisis is gonna be off the charts this year for us. Um, and so it's, it's just that year 2020, I think kind of going back to the cosmology and I think there is like this gigantic worldwide shamanic death happening. And I've talked about that a lot in the podcast, but it's like a lot more people are waking up to energy or to even psychology or just getting help or changing themselves. It's like everybody like was forced to just sit in their houses and look at each other and be like, well, what do we do now? And I think it's been a powerful, powerful opportunity for humanity right now to change course. Yeah, yeah. And since so many people are in it right now, just like addiction, they can't see the gift that it is until they actually face and overcome the crisis that it was. And, um, and that, that's, where our, that's where our wisdom really shows up in its real glory is after the experience, during the knowledge gathering, you know, portion. And then we begin to turn around and apply that knowledge, you know, put it to action and the wisdom starts to show up. And then that's when we have gratitude and we have, we have forgiveness. We have all these other gorgeous emotions that support us and help us to move forward. And, uh, and in hindsight, I mean, I can say with all honesty, Thomas, I am really grateful for my alcohol and drug addiction. My, my, at first, when I first got into recovery, I was, I was chock full of shame. I had regrets. I, I had remorse. And, um, but now years later with, with a real honing of my personal, you know, growth and development, I'm like, man, I am so glad that happened because now I'm, I'm a much better person today. And I don't know if I would have gotten here had I not gone through, as you called it, that dark night of the soul, which is from the writings of St. John of the Cross. And uh, fan fantastic understanding. 
And, and what's true for you personally and what's true for me personally is actually true for our families as a group. It's true for um, our, 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 our geographical groups. Like I live in Southern California, you know, there is a group energy going on here. Um, the, uh, a national identity, you know, the American experience, um, uh, you know, and why not go to the big one? The human beings, our collective experience is coronavirus, you know? And if mother earth was going to grab hold of us and get our attention and say, hey, you kids, wake the heck up. Um, she would give us all a little viral scare to slow us down, to get us to look at what's going on and then begin to re reset things, rebirth ourselves into a new human experience. We shall see what happens, you know? I, I mean, I like to think that, that we're being given a gift with COVID-19. It's just that it's a matter of what do we do with it? You know, um, I, didn't, I didn't recognize the gift of my alcohol and recovery until after many trials and errors, you know? You know, quitting, returning to the drugs and alcohol, quitting, returning, quitting. I did that a few times. So maybe our human species, we're still going through this quitting and, and, and returning thing. You know, the 20th century, you know, everything from 1901 to, to, to uh, 2001, you know, that was, a, that was a pretty interesting 100 years. And now here we are ushering in, we're in the first fifth of the, second, of the next 100 years. And we're already looking at some pretty interesting times. So we really too are going through our own century of, of change and discovery and, and we'll see. We shall see, you know. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, one of the big things I'm seeing is this, this um, I think consciousness technology versus actual technology. I think there's going to be a crossroads eventually of, you know, the technology is important, but we also have so much more potential in the human potential, I think. Yeah. yeah. We're still experiencing a crisis of externalism that we, we think everything is out here, uh, that, that the computer, the handheld device, the car, the building, all of these externals are, are more important than the internals. And I, and I believe that we really are in a personal crisis as a species of moving away from the external identification to the in, internal identification. And Absolutely. Uh, that's why often you hear people talk about returning to one's heart center. You know, you see the, the amazing work that's being done. Joe Dispenza, just Dispenza is just amazing to, to, to listen to and to read his work. He works with this fellow, um, uh, Dr. Howard Martin at the uh, Heart Math Institute up in San Jose, California. The work that they're, they're putting out and sharing with the world is just fantastic. And it's, it's helping us to realize how much our hearts and our intentions and our feelings really matter. And you and I both know that from NLP that how much of what we think and feel about things is so critical to the outcome. And, uh, and, and that goes in both directions. If we don't, if, if we have feelings of doubt or insecurity, or we have personal injury that we're hanging on to, it can so interfere with, with our personal expression in the world and our ability to attract. You know? Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm curious on how have you used NLP since class? Like, have you done some breakthrough sessions? Have you done, um, you know, map across with people? Like, have you introduced this into your group at all? Has that been possible? I, yeah, I, I, my groups are, are groups. I've got anywhere from six to, to 20 in a group. Um, so I have, I've done some small demonstrations and, and I've also done some explaining of how NLP works. Um, uh, I haven't done a lot of personal one-on-one uh, -on -one work with people beyond just practice for myself. Um, I do have a, a, uh, a smoking cessation model I've, I've put together using a, um, uh, a meditation that Dr. Matt has, has uh, you know, made available to us. Getting my clients to participate one-on-one, -on -one, that's a little challenging. You know, they're, they're nervous. Uh, they, they're, 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 they're going through a lot. And so I, at this time, I'm still kind of, um, you know, feeling things out. I haven't actually created a, a working model yet where I can work with the clients one-on-one. -on -one. Though I have a couple of options. Um, two of my, my first 
clients who were supposed to meet me, you know, at 1.30 on Monday, uh, you know, one of them, a woman, she has this uh, late night eating disorder that she wanted to overcome. And she was like, oh, I, I would do anything to be done with this problem. And, um, but she wasn't willing to show up at 1.30 and meet me on Monday. <laughs> mm-hmm. She canceled, uh, you know, three hours ahead of me getting there. So, so clearly there was enough going on in her that she couldn't even make it to the meeting. And um, I had a guy last week that I was going to do a smoking cessation thing with. And, um, and he told me he would love to quit smoking. And um, I was there, I was ready. And I asked one of his buddies, I said, hey, where's so-and-so? And they're like, oh, he had to work today. And I'm like, yeah, well, he was going to, you know what I mean? So you can see I'm still dealing with their, their personality, you know, and character issues. Just getting them to show up for the meeting is, is challenging, you know, so, but I'm not giving up. I am going to, I'm going to keep plugging away. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. And, and I can totally relate with that. There's so many times that people schedule things and I, and, and they don't show up because I think the, the NLP and the breakthrough session stuff, it's people can feel it. They're like, oh, I really have to face this. Like, I'm actually going to have to change. Like, I really have to do that. And, and I think everybody before a breakthrough session, they're nervous. They're like, the trauma, the baggage, it's all getting shooken up because, you know, quantum mechanics, like it knows your energy knows, like it's about to be shifted. Yeah. And uh, it's it, some of the breakthrough sessions I've done recently. It's just so inspiring to see people shift their entire physiology throughout from start to finish. It's just like, I think that's a different person that's walking away from me right now. Like, wow, it's so powerful. And and I think one of the best stories about addiction in NLP is, is the, um, the, I can never remember his name. I think Dr. Dr. Tanaka. Oh yeah. 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 And you can probably tell that story a lot better than I can, I think, but it seems like the most powerful map across um, yeah. well, session doing, of all time. Yeah. He was doing submodality belief changes and he was working within a, an addiction uh, uh, program down in Florida in the, uh, I think it was called Paradise, Florida. I wasn't Paradise, but anyways, um, and uh, and you know he was very innocently just doing his internship there, and he had these NLP skills in his pocket, and uh, and he just started you know working with these clients, and uh, it it went viral so to speak, and uh, and his the, the 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 population in that particular community in that little where he was working in, they started they started learning from him and then teaching each other, which is really fantastic when you think about that. And uh, so, yeah, and, and uh, he got an award for it. It was just such a fantastic thing. They, they caught up with him. He had, he had moved on, he was back in Japan and, um, and they caught up with him and said, hey, by the way, we want to give you an award for something. He's like, what? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and he, didn't, he wasn't even able to make, uh, make the connection until they reminded him. His name is, um, uh, Dr. Taka Endo is his name. Yeah, lovely guy. Yeah. yeah, I was actually hoping to interview him for the book because I thought that that would make a wonderful, you know, story to share in the book. So far in all of my writings, I haven't actually used any um, uh, stories outside of what I read. Um, but someone like Dr. Endo, I would love to be able to use his story in the book. I just haven't gotten to that stage, you know, caught up with him. He's a busy guy. Yeah. But, um, and when you think about it, you know, submodality belief changes is one of the first things that we learn in the introduction to the neuro-linguistic programming. And there it is really a, a most powerful tool. And it's just so basic, you know, and of course, by the time you get to breakthrough sessions and doing hypnosis and MER, it, this is really, this is life-changing stuff, you know. So you made an interesting reference earlier about technology. And I'd like to think that NLP is a technology. And it's a it's a very human technology, and uh, and I think that that's what makes it one of the greatest tools going forward. Um, you know, helping people with um, any kind of personal growth and development is using these tools and techniques of NLP. Yeah, absolutely. I I totally agree. It's a technology, and you know, I'm not a, a, a medical practitioner or a licensed um, licensed practitioner because I'm not an MD or a um, you know, masters in psychology and all those other things, you know, um, but the medical side of the breakthrough sessions is so interesting to me, you know, like Dr. Matt was talking about of like, you know, we can use the emotion code, the Louise Hayes model of like, you know, what's the actual pain, what's the illness, and let's capture the emotion that's connected to that part of the body, 
and let's release it. And the outcomes from that, you know, in a medical perspective is, is light years ahead of the medical field right now. It's just, they can't even explain it. And I was so blessed to have a couple medical doctors in our class. And it was so amazing to hear them say, I cannot wait to offer my patients a breakthrough session instead of a prescription. And I think that is truly the future of medicine if we allow it. Oh, I totally agree with you. And I, I, you know, I um, I have another um, uh, sideline thing I do. I do sound healing uh, in the same uh, recovery community, and um, it's planetary gongs, crystal bowls, other you know um, traditional instruments, flutes, drums, and um, and the power of sound and just meditation um, is just so transformative. And and when I really started to get deep into the understanding of you know, what is frequency and vibration and, 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 and really what makes up our bodies, what makes up our, our, our standard, you know, atomic model and it's frequency and vibration. And, uh, and I'm just like, wow. And I, and I think about how, how subtly and how easily the clients are just are transformed. I, I wish I had gotten to the habit of doing before and after photographs of people's facial expressions before the meditation and afterwards, because I have, I've basically almost not even been able to recognize somebody after the sound healing meditation because they moved out of their pain body in, into their kind of, you know, conscious self and, their, and all of their stress moved away. They're, they softened, they glowed, they smile, all these like gorgeous attributes that, that we're working so hard for. And it, and it all takes place in a, in a 45 minute to an hour meditation, just just surrendering, you know, comforting the body and all these wonderful kind of, you know, softening techniques. Um, not, not really trying so hard, but actually trying less, doing nothing. <laughs> yeah. Literally, literally just do nothing. It's like, it's like resting the nervous system for the first time in a long time, right? If there's so much input and technology and information and schedules and work and all that stuff. And it's like, to just sit down or to lay down for 45 minutes and be engulfed in that frequency. I've gone to a couple of those group uh, sound healing sessions and it is absolutely transforming. Like you're saying the whole body, your whole energy shifts, your whole perspective shifts. It's, it could be life-changing for some people. I could see how that's possible or even, you know, how this is possible to bring on like, um, Dr. Joe spins the type mystical healing experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I have a gorgeous opportunity when I'm doing the sound healing to use my own, um, my words and my intention. Um, uh, you know, I'm the, it's myself and my partner, my girlfriend, uh, we, we, um, we do it together. So, you know, she's already laying down a nice fabric of sound behind me. I get to speak, I get to set the tone, I get to set the, the feeling. And then the last thing they hear when they're waking up out of their, you know, 50 minute reverie is my voice once again, reaffirming the attention. And it really, you know, you know how hypnosis works and how programming the subconscious works. It's, it's a gorgeous opportunity to just infect people with a positive outlook, you know, an expanded outlook. Um, I use all of this language of possibility. There's never a negative suggestion. And if there's any reference to anything which is negative, it's usually with a humoristic bent. And, uh, and nothing helps people to, to get over themselves than a good, than a good bout of laughter. And, uh, and so there's always an opportunity to joke and to play. And, and it's just amazing, that combination. So I'm actually using the NLP models, the linguistics, in my sound healing meditation because I'm, I'm literally capturing their attention. So I, I, I get to uh, build rapport. I, I get to, you know, you know, do the, the sensory acuity thing. I, I, I'm, a, I'm setting intentions. It's, it's actually, I'm using it in such a subtle way that you wouldn't know I'm doing it. And that's kind of one of the best ways to lead people that they don't know they're being led. And of course we have a, almost a hundred percent approval rating with the sound healings. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's so humbling too, because I get to do something I absolutely love to do and, and the clients, they can't wait, they clamor for it, you know? So that's been a real gorgeous thing too, is working with sound, working with clients in recovery and, and in mental health. 
and um, and just helping them to you know to go beyond these very self-limiting behaviors that we we've, we've developed over the years. You know? Wow, that sounds so amazing. Yeah, the sound healing is I love it. I listen to that you know, frequency music almost every night to meditation or in the morning. And it just, it changes everything. It's so powerful. And um, yeah, what else have, what other projects have you been working on? Well, um, you know, I'm modeling myself after you. I would like to get into podcasting. Uh, I did a little workshop last week on starting my own podcast. People have been asking us for a few years now, like, why don't we put our sound on YouTube? So I'm going to link my podcast to a YouTube channel that I'll be putting together um, some more of this, you know, uh, FaceTime with the sound, because I think to a certain degree, people really need to understand um, how is it that sound is so effective. And it's also a platform for me to share more of, um, of my ideas about how, how people can heal themselves, how they can work together in helping each other to heal. And, um, and so really, um, I've been, you know, just boning up on, on understanding how to use this format. Um, started doing some Zoom classes uh, with the NLP um, uh, graduates, um, you know, on a Thursday night. So that's one of the time slots and getting used to this kind of uh, technology that, um, that COVID-19 is really putting us in a position to have to use more frequently. So we'll just, we'll, we'll consider it to be a blessing. And, um, and I've, and my plate is full brother. I mean, between writing on a daily basis and doing the sound healing. And I teach these classes um, that are actually the basis for my book. It's called Wild Women's Warrior's Way. And um, so I, I meet four times a week with um, anywhere from six to 20 clients. And, uh, and, uh, and we, we, uh, we chat up a storm. We talk about everything from ancient aliens to, to you know, how sound healing works. Uh, I've been able to share my tuning forks. I have a whole tuning fork regimen that I, that I use. I do biofield tuning. I'm a certified practitioner. And, um, and the clients just, they love anything that, that helps them to move beyond their addiction compulsions and their idea that somehow the world is limited and, uh, and to bring them into a conversation about the, the infinite possibilities. And that's where the quantum mechanics comes in. The idea that, that it's an infinite universe, not a finite universe. And, and I'm also fond of the notion that the Big Bang Theory is one of the weakest stories going. And there are so many other, you know, preferable stories. One of which I like is the Electric Universe um, uh, storyline, that, uh, that, that there was no Big Bang. Uh, that 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 to me is it's it goes against all all common sense you know how could you get something from nothing you know absolutely yeah and and that's in the book too um and, and i am and i am willing to accept that i I'll, I'll be written off by some readers as a pseudo scientist and i'm okay with that you know many an explorer had to face unknown perils and I am exploring with ideas. I am exploring with concepts. And I'll even, I'll even go as far as to say that, um, you know, Newton said he only, only was able to achieve what he achieved in his time by standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, that being true today, we owe it to ourselves to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and reach and express and explore to the best of our abilities, you know? And have a good time doing it for Christ's sakes. You know? Yeah, <laughs> so true. So true. You know, sometimes I feel like that exact same thing, like, you know, a wild and fire community is just like, I'm talking about quantum mechanics and coaching and mental, emotional healing and all this stuff. And it's just, it's, it's kind of foreign to a lot of the people out there, but it's, it's so important, especially when we really open our minds and expand our minds to exactly what we just talked about for the last little while of just quantum mechanics, ancient mythology, healing, sound. I mean, there's just the spectrum of what's possible is infinite. And uh, yeah, and, and I just want to open it up to you. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Any questions I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? Um, questions? Well, I mean, I could talk on endlessly about this because this is my passion. This is my love. And, um, and even as you speak, I could just, just information is just pouring in. 
And, uh, and this is basically the way our classes go when I do these groups in, in the recovery programs. We just, we just open up the conversation and, uh, and I do my notes, I do my preparation, but I allow the group to basically lead itself. And uh, it's just amazing how much we know and we just don't realize how much we know. And there is this notion, this, this um, uh, anti-intellectualism that seems to pervade in our culture. And, uh, and I think if people just got over that and realized learning stuff and, and discovering new things, it's a blast. It's, I mean, it's very liberating. So I often say to a lot of people, you know, you have so many opportunities to get an education beyond high school and college or whatever your level of education is, you know, you owe it to yourself to keep learning. And then, and then that's one of the greatest gifts you know, the position that you're in, the position that I'm in, is that we get to be interpreters. We get to read about quantum physics or read about ancient Sanskrit writings and, uh, and then bring them to our, 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 our firefighting community or to, you know, other communities that we, we, we belong to. Um, not everybody has the passion or the industry to understand these things. So if we can put it into a communicable form, if we can change the language, just to make it perceivable, you know, I like to say you meet people where they're at, you know, so in your wildlands firefighting community, you know, if they have a certain way of communicating, you are an interpreter to the outside information and you're going to turn it into their operating language. So if the word is quantum mechanics and they're like, huh, well, you have to turn it into something that they can understand until quantum mechanics becomes part of their, of their, um, uh, lexicon, you know, they're, they're operating vocabulary or language. And you'd be amazed. Look how Dr. Taka Endo got those people down in Florida uh, talking about SMDs. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, were, they were talking about it like it was a drug. And uh, because they were having such an, a, a liberating experience, they were literally getting high doing neuro linguistic programs. <laughs> it's yeah. so amazing yeah That's so exactly. true yeah. and exactly what you're saying of like using the right language and you know my my big theme is like leadership peak performance and mindset and what I did was I was like, well, I love mind, body, spirit. How can I fit that into wildland fire? And that's what I came up with. And, and the audience loves that stuff. They really do want the leadership, peak performance and mindset. Yeah. And to get all those three things, you've got to really focus on mind, body, spirit. It's synonymous. It's, it's uh, the deeper layer of all that stuff. Right. And, and I, I love the way you, you use that. It's like, yeah, we got to, you know, interpret all these things that we can as master practitioners, and give it to the world in an understandable, beautiful way. It's, it's such an amazing thing, especially as writers. We're yeah. both writers. And it's just, yeah. for me, I feel like the universe is just condensed and pouring through me when I write. And it's just like, I just feel so good. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. I, I, and I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, brother, because you, you lit that fire within me for writing that I had, I had, I had been fearful. I had been unwilling to move forward for many, many years. And, uh, and, I, and I, I actually went to graduate school for, for writing back in the 1980s and I dropped out. I had my own personal crisis at the time. And, and there was this deep hurt, this deep kind of shame that, uh, that really was holding me back for 30 years. And, um, and man, when, that, when that cork was pulled out of that, that reluctance, all of a sudden I'm now, I can't wait to write. You know, I'm, I'm writing in the bathtub. Even though I'm not sitting with pencil and paper in hand, my mind is writing. And, um, and then by the time I get back to the, the, to the pad of paper with my pen, um, I don't have to think about what am I going to write now. It's just, it's like the, it's like the pen is quivering, waiting for me to pick it up. It's, it's a fantastic experience. And so I really do believe that there is something pouring through. That even Albert Einstein talked about the, the, the universe thinking through him. It was a wonderful quote of his. You know, Albert Einstein was such a mystic. To, to call him a physicist was that was like a that was like a sideline job. He was a, he was a real mystic. He really thought in mystical ways. He used sound healing for himself. He was a daily violin player. He believed in one half an hour of violin playing, like faithfully before any thought experiment that he went into. And uh, and I just love that stuff because 
that's the part that if we don't pay attention, we're going to miss out on the beauty of the mystery. And, uh, and so anytime we can capture that memory and bring it to a group of people or even to bring it to ourselves, what a gift. Uh, yeah, so amazing. What an amazing interview. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, Welcome, welcome. So awesome to connect with you. And I really want you to come back because I can see how we could do probably a hundred podcasts and have just perfect, amazing conversations because we're on the same page. And yeah. uh, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart on coming on the show and, and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, brother. I, I, I feel honored to be invited. And I, I love the opportunity to practice sharing with people, you know, this, uh, this awakening that we're all going through and just to help people realize, you know, it's, it's all good. We're, we're all moving in the right direction together. And the, the, and the more we can, we can acknowledge that, uh, the more easily that we'll, we'll shift and flow and grow. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Is there any links, any social media you want to um, shout out so people can get uh, a hold of you? Well, yeah, I, um, I have my, uh, uh, my webpage, which is hummingbirdsoundhealers.com. So it's hummingbirdsoundhealers.com, all one string. And, um, and it's, a, you know, it's a website in progress. Um, I still have you know, information I'm putting in there. My email is on there, my phone number. I, I keep things very personal. I work one-on-one -on -one with people. And, um, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm inventing myself one day at a time here. And, uh, and I find all of this to be exciting. So anybody who reached out to me, I would engage them with all my heart. You know? so. Oh, that's so beautiful. So amazing. And thank you so much for coming on the show again. And I think we helped so many people just get one step closer to their sacred ancestry. And thank you so much. And um, thank you for everybody listening and, and have a beautiful evening. Blessings to you, Thomas.